Good morning. We are two months into the COVID-19 restrictions and we see various comments and various ideas about the virus, about the appropriateness of the response or not on the part of our leaders. And some people in the U.S. are even questioning right now whether or not churches should be going along with some of these restrictions, considering that they are an infringement upon our rights. Today, regardless of who, what, or why, I want to call your attention to an important scripture which should be an encouragement for all of us as Christians. My text describes a head of state, apparently easily swayed by self-serving cabinet members. Some have deep pockets, and some have highly motivated agendas. And we see in our text about how he responds to these different influences. Under the government, the people of God are vulnerable. They were postured and subject to the whims of whoever was in the highest offices. Those who were in office have both the means and the motivation to repress and to destroy the people of God. This is our setting that we can find. There could be parallels to other countries today, maybe our country at some time in the future. Many thousands of God's people in our text today can only cry out to God because of their jeopardy. My text is the book of Esther, and while most are familiar with the plot line and the triangle between Mordecai, Haman, and Esther, I instead would like to call your attention to another layer of the narrative. Today I'd like to call your attention to the sway on the king, first of all by the influencers who are around his throne, his cabinet, and secondly by the values that are held by the society in that day. Both have an exercise and influence on the king. In contrast to these threats to God's people, we can also see humor in our text today. Humor because there's a sovereign God and he repeatedly outplays every human actor on the stage. Such a testimony to God's sovereignty ought to be an encouragement to every believer who is worried about tomorrow or how the next election is going to turn out or what the future holds for the world or what's happening with regard to COVID-19. The point that we're going to be examining today is that God is in control. He always has been. He always will be. First, we're going to look at the king and his influencers. Esther begins with two banquets. They're both put on by the king to impress all of his people and leaders. On the last day of the banquet, the show-off king decides that he, in addition to showing off everything else, he wants to show off his beauty queen wife, Queen Vashti. However, Queen Vashti refused the show-off king. And then the king, because of that, is perplexed. He's angry. And so he asks his cabinet members what he should do. Listen as I read Esther chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Then the king said to the wise men, who understood the times, for it was the custom of the king, so to speak, before all who knew law and justice, and were close to him, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who had access to the king's presence and sat in the first place in the kingdom. According to law, what is to be done with Queen Vashti, because she did not obey the command a king who has Uirus, delivered by the eunuchs? As we look at that question that uh, King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes as he's also called, uh, gives to the cabinet members, one man steps forward and he's concerned about the implications of the queen's refusal for all the husbands everywhere. He says, depose her. It should be a lesson for all. The show-off king and his cabinet liked the guy's idea and the king signed off on it. Now, when the king got over his anger that he had toward Queen Vashti, some of his attendants said, now you need to force all of the most beautiful virgins in the land to become part of your harem. Then take your pick. Decide who you like most and let her be Vashti's replacement. The show-off king liked the idea and the stage was set for the young Jewish girl Esther to be taken in and added to the harem. The queen, excuse me, the king liked Esther, and she became the next queen. Time goes by, and the king promotes and honors a political rising star named Haman. Haman was proud of his advancement and of his honor, 
But he greatly resented the fact that there was one man, a Jew by the name of Mordecai, who refused to bow and to give him the honor that he felt he deserved. However, Haman decided that rather than just try to eliminate Mordecai, instead he would go ahead and try to just remove the whole Jewish race from the kingdom. He went to the king. He told the king that it was not in the king's best interest to let the Jews remain. He also sweetened the pot by making a huge financial offer. He offered to the state treasury, which had already been depleted because of the king's father's, one of his wars, uh, Haman offered to the treasury 300 tons of silver, a huge sum. The show-off king liked the idea, possibly even without doing any background checking to find out about the ramifications of wiping out a whole people group from within his realm. He gave Haman his signet ring to sign off on the proposal and said, do with the people as you please. Now you have to consider this is now the third incident in Esther where the king does what his lieutenants command, based on what is in his best interest. A fourth example is when the now insomniac king hears of Mordecai saving his life. When this happens, this is quite some time later in the story, but when this happens, he decides to ask one of his counselors what he ought to do. The door is opened and there stands Haman. The king asks Haman what he should do for, uh, he doesn't name him, but what should he do for someone whom the king wants to honor? And on the basis of what uh, Haman recommends, again, the king makes the immediate decision to go ahead with the plan. Now, what we can see, though, is that in each situation where the king has a question, he goes to his advisors and immediately acts, asks, acts on the basis of what those advisors say. Now, besides the king being influenced by his advisors, we also have the influence of the social values of the kingdom that are coming into play. It was the custom of the Persian kings to generously ward courageous and beneficial actions that were done in, in favor of the king or the kingdom. Now, Mordecai saved the king's life. Where that is recounted in the narrative, we would expect that in the next paragraph that Mordecai should have been rewarded accordingly with some sort of honor or advancement. But instead we read in the text that the very next passage describes how Haman was promoted. This was unusual. The narrator has put this together in this form and it should raise questions about well, what was Mordecai's response after he saved the king's life and he didn't get any kind of recognition for it. We see that extravagant display and honor are highly regarded in the Persian court. As an example of some of the extravagance, consider this, that as the book of Esther opens up, we find that there's a six-month banquet and display of the king's power and might and his riches, followed by a seven-day banquet in the palace garden where the highest officials are invited, an opulent display, all, all, no, no expense was spared to put this on. Then we see at the same time that Vashti, uh, the queen, was giving a banquet um, for the ladies of the uh, high ladies of the realm. Then we see the next scenario is Esther's coronation, when Esther is installed as the queen. Another banquet is given at this time. Then we can see there are two more banquets which Esther gives for the king and Haman. Now, the plot is changing, of course, at this time, but what we note is that there are a number of different extravagant displays of riches and opulence throughout the whole uh, storyline. It's part of the culture, it's part of what the people would have expected. As far as honor is concerned, we find that Memukin, he was the prince that suggested deposing Vashti. Um, he, appealed to the fa he appealed to the fact that Vashti when she refused to come at the king's bequest, actually dishonored not only the king, but all the peoples in all of the provinces. And she said that now all of the ladies in Persia would do the same, and so dishonor their husbands. We also can see that when Haman was advanced, 
the king gave a command that everyone should bow for Haman as Haman entered into the court precincts, as he entered into the gate where a lot of the business was conducted for the land. Then we find that Haman was bragging to his friends and to his family about his riches, his promotion, and his favor which the queen had shown toward him by inviting him to a special banquet only with the king. Of course, he doesn't know what's going on at that particular time, but again, honor is very significant in, and highly valued amongst the people of the day. We then see in Haman's recommendation to the king for what the king should do to honor a person with whom the king was especially well pleased. And as Haman goes on thinking that the, the, this honor is going to be given toward him, he goes to great length to say about how the king's robe should be put on the man. Again, the whole idea of honor and respect so that the people would bow down before such an individual. The book of Esther then shows, on the one hand, a head of state who is influenced and controlled by others. They may have highly motivated personal agendas, and every time this happens, we find that the head of state follows in lockstep conformity to whatever the accepted uh, proposal was and the values there of the society. Now, the question I would ask you at this time, do you see any parallels to today? Heads of state, that are mere puppets acting at the, in the best interest of those who pull the strings, the puppeteers who dictate what should happen. Depending upon your political background and, per, and persuasion, uh, you might identify different puppeteers behind the scenes, different ones that are really the ones behind what is happening at the time. At a higher spiritual level, we can imagine that there are uh, forces that are influencing what takes place. The Apostle Paul speaks about spiritual wickedness and powers in high places. and Certainly there could be, at a higher level, something like that that's taking place. But what I want to call your attention to today is that in spite of these people that are influencing heads of state, in spite of the mores and about the principles, the values of the society, what is highly valued and what isn't, which might be very different from what it was 40, 50, 60 years ago. Think with me for a minute on a th side thought. The values that were uh, looked up to in our country 40 or 50 years may no longer hold sway as public opinion has shifted and changed. The idea of political correctness, correctness is very, very commonly used in many different contexts today. And we find that our society is in a different place than it was 50 or 60 years ago. Heads of state, those that are in positions of leadership, are very much influenced by both those that are influencing them powers and puppeteers and cabinet members and all different forces. They are influenced by all of that. But as we look at the book of Esther, what we can find in the book of Esther is that there is a God who is on a higher throne than Xerxes, and he is reigning in Esther's day, and he is reigning today as well. In Esther, we see God who was working above, in spite of, and for his purposes, a woman's refusal for the king's request with Queen Vashti. We can see scheming and plotting as Haman is frustrated and upset, not only with Mordecai, but with uh, all of his people. We can see pride motivating, moving people to different actions. We can see murderous plots, at least two in the, in the text. On the one hand, there is the plot that was uncovered to assassinate King Ahasuerus. Mordecai heard about that. He gave the information to Esther, and Esther then reported it to the king. That was one murderous plot. Then we have the murderous plot whereby Haman had the intentions of destroying, wiping out the whole Jewish race, all the people that were there within the realm. We also see weak leaders. We can see a king who makes his decision based upon the first counselor or the group of counselors that might make a suggestion to him. We see a beautiful orphan who is uh, not in her land, but has been brought with her people there to this particular land of uh, Persia. And her parents have died. She's being raised by an elder cousin. 
We also then see plotting influencers that are in the scene. We have a, there's an overheard conspiracy. There are hidden motives. And then there is the king's insomnia. All of these are all part of the stew that make up the narrative, the storyline of Esther. But what we see here is that there is a humor involved as well. The humor of the wicked Haman being outplayed and outflanked by God at every single turn. That should not be missed. It's almost like a sitcom with timed punchlines. Esther presents a rhythm of the wicked Haman and the show-off king, totally controlled by God without even knowing it. God is sovereign. God is on the throne. He's calling the shots. He's allowing people to move, and they think they're moving according to what they want to do, but God is very much controlling what the outcome will be. As we look at this, I would suggest to you today that Esther should give you confidence that no matter how much you might despair and fret over what is happening either in the world today or in our country, or about what is happening with regard to this COVID-19 situation, with regard to the political scenario of the international scene with regard to different countries and powers and what's taking place, with regard to China or uh, any other major world powers, uh, whatever's involved, those could give us concern. But the fact is that God still sits on his throne. And his son controls the destiny of the nations. Listen as I read from Psalm 2, verses 1 through 4. Why are the nations in an uproar, and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. As I said, Esther is a sitcom of God laughing from heaven as evil men try to destroy his people. He is not, uh, he is not impacted, nor are his plans for his people turned aside by these evil actions of people on earth. They never make a play here on earth without first being outmaneuvered by God. And it's no different today. Listen to these verses from the Psalms. Psalm 103, verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. And then Psalm 47. O oh, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with a voice of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. As we look at that and understand, see how it applies to the book of Esther, I'd like to go ahead now and advance the timetable, the chronology about 500 years after Esther. That would put us at Calvary. At Calvary, we find the Son of God who is crucified. It's a day that Satan was rejoicing, and I'm sure all the demonic forces were as well. But at Christ's crucifixion, though it was a time for rejoicing on the part of Satan, God again outmaneuvers, outmanipulates. And so Christ's crucifixion became the means of victory over sin and death. God was in control on that day too. All of Satan's fury was hurled at God's Son, but God was in control and had a purpose and plan that would not be thwarted. Nor is his plan going to be thwarted on earth today or at any future day. Down through the centuries, Satan's forces have tried to bring persecution and death on God's people, God's children. But as he has attempted that, down through the centuries, the church has been purified. The church has been strengthened. And the church has even multiplied, even in the face of persecution. What we can see is that in every age and over every human government, God is ultimately in control. He may permit us to be in duress. We may wonder, why do the wicked prosper? But just like Esther, God is in control. He is in control of your life. He is in control of our nation. 
He is in control of what the wicked men can do, and he only allows what he is all part of his plan. Though the wicked may prosper today, his days are numbered. Listen as I read from Psalm 37. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in the way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil doing. For evil doers will be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked man will be no more. And you will look carefully for his place, and it will not be there. But the humble will inherit the land, and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. The wicked plots against the righteous, and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees his day is coming. I would challenge you, as the Apostle Paul said in the book of Philippians, don't be anxious about anything. Instead, in everything, by prayer and with your requests and supplications, bring those before God's throne. Put your confidence and faith in the fact that your God sits on the throne. He rules over all. His Son dictates what shall ultimately happen here on earth. Put your faith in Him. I would like to close with these words of Jesus from John chapter 14. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Do not let your heart be troubled, and let it not be fearful. I would share that last verse with you today, that promise of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the one that is the son that is exalted and put on the throne in Psalm 2. And as it says in the passages, the Lord laughs and is in derision as he beholds as wicked men try to manipulate and try to control what's going to happen. He is the one that is in charge, that's in control. He's sovereign over the affairs of men. He's sovereign over your life. He will not let anything come into the life of a believer, but that which is good for his purposes. And he'll do that for you. He'll do it for me. He'll do it for those who have called upon Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Let us all look to the Lord who sits on the throne of heaven, who is in control. He is the one that has our destinies and the destinies of our nation and the destinies of our people, of all people. He is in control of all that. Put your faith, put your trust in him today.